All right. Well, as you get those uh, notes, we're, we're super excited as this is uh, installation uh, Sunday that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. And, and we will have some time for, for questions if you have any specific uh, kind of questions about any of that. But I wanted us to dive back into uh, Westminster Confession of Faith as we are looking through that. And, and trying to unpack this is, is what we as a congregation have said, this is what we believe. Right? So for the last 237 years, when, when folks ask, well, First Congregational Church of Woodstock, you know, what are you guys all about? What do you believe? You know, the answer is typically, well, we're all about Jesus, and, and here's our statement of faith, right? We understand all that we know from the scripture. That's, that's the basis of everything that we know about who Jesus is, what he's like, what he's come to do, all of those kinds of things, and that we believe that historically that is explained or summarized very well in this Westminster Confession of Faith, right? So we talked about four different parts of the Westminster Standards, uh, the Confession of Faith that we're looking at specifically chapter by chapter, but then what were the other three parts? Folks remember? Directory. All right, Directory of Public Worship, right? And then... The question and answer is shorter and larger, right? And so in looking at that and unpacking that, what those things are all doing, remember, is not giving us what men think, but it's simply taking what the scripture says, how God has revealed himself, and explaining how all those things fit together, right? So that we have this little passage in Genesis that tells us this part of who God is, and then we see that worked out throughout the scripture, but there are all these different pieces and so we're trying to fit those into a comprehensive whole on any particular topic, right? So when we look at things like, what does it mean that God is triune, right? How do we understand God is one God in three persons, right? Well, Westminster takes a chapter to explain, again, all of what the scripture says about that particular thing. So this morning we're looking particularly in chapter three of Westminster Confession of Faith, and the, the topic is God's plan of redemption, or as the, the uh, um, Confession of Faith titles the chapter of God's eternal decree, right? And so this is, this is the part that so often when we get talking about theolo theology and, and what we believe versus other competing beliefs about the scripture, right? That oftentimes this is what me people mean when they say, well, we're reformed. Right? Now, reform, we'll see, is much broader than that, but often this is the, this is the real sticking point that, that folks are getting at. The fascinating thing to me is, is that, that a lot of this chapter is agreed upon by both reformed and non-reformed. In fact, Arminius, the, the guy who got us into Arminianism, right, would, would believe a lot of these things in terms of God's decrees and, and all that he's, he's done all, all of that. The question that we'll get into is, okay, why did God decree what he decreed, and how absolute is that? What, is that, what does that mean in, in, uh, in our daily lives, right? So as we look through this, I'm going to actually skip down. You'll, you'll see that, that Westminster Confession of Faith here has eight different sections. That's what we get at in terms of the summary that I provide you each week. Uh, each of those uh, numbered items is a summary of a whole paragraph usually our whole section under the, the chapter. And I want us to skip to the last one first, okay? So in talking about these things of God's plan of redemption, you'll see here that, it, that this is a great mystery that is to be handled with grace and humility. And that is so important because oftentimes these doctrines are handled like a two-by-four, right? Or a golf club. Right? And, and that's, that's not at all what these things are about. Right? If we're truly understanding what it means that God has a plan of redemption that is all his doing and not anything that we contribute to, right? that grace ought to constantly overwhelm us and make us much more graceful, humble, and gracious in talking with other people, right? Now, I've shared some, with some of you my story in terms of growing up in a, in a different theological tradition than this, right? In, in a 
not only Southern Baptist churches, but in specifically very free will oriented or Armenian oriented Southern Baptist churches where, where these things were anathema, right? Uh, and, and so I came into this in college kicking and screaming, right? Thinking, what in the world is this pastor, you know, doing? But it's where all the pretty girls were going to church, so what are you going to do, right? So, so over those years of college, right, I'm hopefully since grown up, right, and, and have a wonderful wife, so I'm not, I'm not uh, in this for, for that any longer. But, but that's, that's what they were teaching. And, and I, I wrestled with this whole thing of, okay, he keeps referring to the Bible, but then saying things that, that I've never heard anybody say the Bible teaches, right? And how do I, how do I put those things together? So it was three years of, of just going back to the scripture. And for every question that I had uh, of, of this pastor, he just kept saying, well, let's see what, what God says about that, right? And go to the scripture and look at what the scripture says about those things. So this, this plan of, of redemption that God has come up with, it was his idea. Nobody said to him, you have to save some folks, right? And un, unlike our uh, precious moments kind of hallmark uh, uh, sentimentality of our culture, this wasn't God in eternity past going, you know, I'm kind of lonely, right? I'd, I'd really like to have some people around that, that I could be nice to, right? It's hard being Santa Claus when there's nobody to take presents to, right? That's, that's not what God did. How do we know that? Because God has told us what he's done and why he's done it, right? And the ultimate reason that he's done all of what he's done in creation and salvation with everything about redemption is about his glory, he will be shown to be the all-glorious, only one worthy of praise in all of creation. And that's hard for us. Because since we were little, we've thought that the world revolved around what? Right. You know, remember those terrible twos and threes and for some of you fours and fives and fifties? <laughs> right? What do you mean the world doesn't revolve around me? Well, this is the Christian equivalent of that. What do you mean that God doesn't revolve around me? What do you mean that God's plan of redemption doesn't revolve around me? I'm quite sure that from the beginning of, uh, from before time, that, that God said, I've got to come up with Doug Warren so that I can create his awesomeness and then save him and be his God for all eternity. I'm quite sure that that's what was going through God's mind. But Scripture says something quite different, right? It's that none of us are all that, but God is. And so that ought to lead us into grace and humility. It ought to lead us into more and more recognizing God's wondrous grace. That he's not done any of this because he had to, or someone was bigger than him and could tell him that he had to do this. But he is the only one who could create and redeem us. And he's done that for his own glory. And so that as we talk about these things, it's important for us to recognize that these are things about which Christians disagree. And, and that, that Christians who disagree with us in these things are brothers and sisters in Christ who God loves incredibly, just like he loves us. And so it's not helpful for us to, to come and, you know, hit them over the head with, with the things that we've learned. And oftentimes these are the things that it's such a huge thing to, to discover more about what God is like and the grace in what, what he's given us. That, that we often have this kind of reaction, right? Sometimes it's described almost as a second conversion. That's how it was in my life, right? I grew up knowing these, the things of Christ and knowing that he saved me, and, but, but thinking that somehow he was looking down the corridors of, of time and that I would choose him, and, and so he, he saved me and, and gave me that gift that I didn't deserve, right? I would talk about grace and all of those things. I didn't deserve it. But not understanding how the scripture talks about these things working, and so when I encountered these, these doctrines and, and saw that they're actually what the scriptures teach, 
it was like a whole new discovery and a whole new rebirth. And then I, I was just gung-ho about converting others, right? And saying, no, God's much bigger than, than what you always believe. He's much bigger than what I always believe, right? And so sometimes there's that angry young Calvinist kind of phase that, that people go through, right? That, that we've got to be gracious and, and humble with and saying, no, 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 that's not it. The other side is, is that this can fall into a fatalism kind of thing, right? Well, if God's decreed it all, he's done it, well, pfft. Okay, sirrah, sirrah, right? It's just whatever. So I might as well go fishing or, you know, watch a movie or do whatever, but it's, you know, it's all up to him. And that's not grace or humility either, right? But understanding that God is the one who has done everything in our redemption ought to motivate us by grace to, to praise him, to delight in him, to want to tell other people about him. So I just wanted to, to cover that. That's, that's something that Westminster itself says in, in these things is, is that this is a mystery. There, there's mystery here that ought to lead us into grace and humility in terms of talking about these things and working through these things rather than us being adamant and trying to convince other people of, of these things, right? Let the Holy Spirit do, do the convincing, right? Uh, let's, let's just focus on what, what the Scripture says. So I'm going to walk through these um, other seven things of, of summary, and then I want us to spend some time looking at a couple of verses that you'll see uh, on the back. But let's, let's just look at each of these, because again, what we, what we believe um, is that the Scripture teaches us what God is like, who He's made us to be, how all of that is supposed to work, right? And He's given that to us in stories and poems and songs and prophecy and all these kinds of different things. But, but that as we pull all those together, this doctrine helps us to understand kind of the flow of how these things, and that, that there, are, there are necessary consequences of certain things. If we believe that God is love, and that God is powerful, right, that leads us to certain things, that, that, that hems us in, and that we can't just say, well, God's a big bully up there, and, you know, you better obey him, or, or he'll get you, right? Well, that, that doesn't fit with what we know about him being all-loving and all-powerful. All Right? So the first thing uh, that, that Westminster deals with in, in this is that God has ordained everything that will ever happen. <coughs> everything. He has ordained or he has decreed this is what will happen. Right? And the immediate kind of struggle that we have is, well, does that just make us puppets or robots? I mean, if, if he's decreed everything, then, then what does it matter? Right? How, do we, how do we avoid fatalism in that? And that's, that's to recognize that, that God, in decreeing it, is far more sovereign, powerful, wise than, than we are, right? I know when I'm trying to get my children to do what I want them to do, right? And I decree, you will do this and you will do it, right? I'm limited in how I can do that, right? And, and so what we tend to do is... is project our limitations on God that he's not bound by. Right? And so God is well capable of working in and through all of our free choices, personalities, all of these different things in ways that beautifully harmonize all of these things together and result in, in the right thing. Right? You may have seen this in, in coaching various different sports. Right? where a good coach knows the players on his team, right? And he's not out there pulling their strings like a marionette trying to get them to do, but he knows how to motivate them. He knows how to get them to work together in, in ways that accomplish what he has decreed or said, this is what we're going to do, right? And that God is, is infinitely more wise, and powerful and understanding and being able to do all of those things. And again, we'll, we'll keep coming back to this mystery aspect. How does he do that? In, in ways that go far beyond us, right? But as we've talked about before, we're finite, he's infinite, right? So as we come up to, to the, the edge of what we can understand, right? And the, through the scripture and reading and wisdom, you know, we're, we're continuing to extend that out but, but we're finite. That, that's only going to go out so far. And then there's this infinite reality of, of God's incredible wonder. Right? 
So to recognize that God has ordained everything that will ever happen. So sometimes people will talk about this like, um, okay, well, God directs the ship. So if you're, if you're taking off uh, from New York City and, and uh, on, a, on a ship going to, to London, right? So uh, the, the cruise line has decreed, right? The, the ship's going to leave New York and it's going to uh, get to, to London and, and that's set, right? Nothing, nothing can change that. But what folks do on deck and below deck and on the ship, right? They're free to do all kinds of different things on the ship, but all of them, right, unless they fall overboard, are, are going to leave New York and get to, to London, right? And so thinking about God's decrees in that kind of limited sense. But what this is saying, it's not that God has just decreed the itinerary of where you're going to end up, but all kinds of things. In fact, everything about where the ship goes, who's on and off deck, who's doing what, and all, all of those things. And again, we look at that and go, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Right? How, how can that be in a way in which we're still doing things without being puppets? But what the scripture is clear about is that God has ordained everything that shall come to pass. Everything that will ever happen. And, and rather than us kind of kicking against that goad, right, and saying, well, I, I don't like that, or that doesn't seem fair, or I don't get that, or, you know, let me encourage you to, to just take some time to stand back and look at that and wonder, right? What would it mean for God to actually be that sovereign? For God to be that all-knowing and that all-powerful, right? I mean, we have a hard time even just thinking of him hearing all of our prayers, right? How many people are there on the planet? Right? Seven, what's the current, some, seven billion or some, somewhere in that, right? And what, you know, how does he, how does he even make it? But again, it's not just what you say to him, but what you're thinking, what you're doing, what you're saying, what, everything, Right? It, it's a little like when we get the, the latest things back from the Hubble microscope or uh, telescope, or we see you know things about uh, you know the, the scientists that deal with space keep going. Oh, oops! We thought the the universe was x trillion blah 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 whatever, right? And and then they just keep upping that by factors of ten or a hundred or a million, right? Going, oh, we didn't we didn't understand. We didn't you know now we can see farther and recognize the, the expanse of space is far more, or the number of things, planets, suns, all of those things is much more. Yeah, Tom? What about evil? Mm. What about evil? The ordained decree mm -hmm. every sort of evil. Yes, and we're going to get to that. Okay. Okay. So, but, and that, that's one of the difficulties, right? Was, okay, if, he's, if he decrees everything, then what about all the awful things that happen? What, how, does, how does that fit? Okay. So, second thing is that this foreordaining was not in response to anything that he foresaw, right? <clears throat> that, that God is so sovereign, that God is, is, again, doing all this before the foundation of time, before there is anything to react to, right? But that, that God is never playing catch-up. He's, he's never responding Right? He's, he's always proactive. Right? And again, think about that in terms of your own experience. Right? When do you tend to respond to things rather than proact in, in terms of what, what you're doing? When something takes us unexpected? Right? When we aren't prepared enough? Right? And in our ideal, you know, when we're on top of our game, we're, we're thinking ahead, we're, we're working on things, and, and we're actively initiating things, right? We tend to react because we've come around a corner that we didn't expect or there's, some, there's something going on. That, that's never true of God. He's always intentionally working out what he wills to do. And so this foreordination of everything that will come to pass is not in response ever to, to something someone else did. It, it's always him doing those things, decreeing those things that, that will come to be. Third, God has predestined some 
to eternal life and others to everlasting death. Again, if he's the one who's foreordained everything that will ever come to pass, nobody gets to heaven or to hell apart from his ordaining it as such. What, what do you normally find people struggling with that? How can a good God send people to hell? Okay, yeah. Did God create a certain portion of the human race for the sole purpose of populating hell? Does that sound fair? <laughs> right? We, we struggle with those things. I mean, that, that's, that's really hard for us to, to kind of get our, our minds around, right? And, and yet one of the things that we've got to recognize is, is that we're in a position in Christ to, to be on the winning team, to be the ones who are going to heaven, and, and we recognize, according to the scripture, that we don't deserve that, right? And, and so there's a very good and proper thing in terms of, hey, we want to, we want to take others with us. I mean, we didn't deserve this, and, and it, it's hard for us to, to imagine other, other people going to hell. And that's, that's very difficult, right? And, and as we understand what hell is, according to the scripture, it becomes increasingly difficult. Right? It's one of those things that the more you find out about Scripture, about things like hell, the, the, the more difficult that that is. Right? And, and yet the thing that we often leave off of that is recognizing that we deserve hell. Right? So the, the fairness piece is not that God has, has created people only to go to hell in, in something that they don't deserve. They didn't have any control over they. It, it's unfair that, that that would happen. Whereas what we find from the scripture is, is that God would have been completely and utterly fair to send the entire human race to hell. The only thing that's unfair about who goes to heaven and who goes to hell is that there's anyone of the human race that doesn't go to hell. Because according to the scripture and a holy God, that's what absolutely every human being ever born entirely deserves, with the only exception being Jesus, who was sinless and perfect. Right? And, and that's the piece that we, you know, we, we may say intellectually, oh yes, that's right, I believe that. But, but the actual, okay, what does that mean? And, and you know, that's, that's something that we, we often pull back from, or that we often have, have great difficulty with. Does that make sense? But again, it's, it's not based on what we think. So for instance, you've got a friend, say, who's, who's uh, or, or maybe your grand, own grandchild. Let's, let's say that because you're going to be more in, in their corner, right? Grandma, granddad, I've got this horrific professor, right? This teacher is just mean. I've done all my work, and, and I missed this one test, Right? And, and there was a good reason that I missed the test. Right? And they tell you a great deal about why they, they missed the test that anyone would understand was a, was a legitimate reason for missing the test. And, and because of that, even though I did all of my homework and all of my projects on all of my assignments, this teacher wants to give me a D in the class. Grandma, this is, this is terrible. This person is so unfair, right? Well. If you've been around the block enough to know, right, yes, you love your granddaughter or grandson, you know, and all those, those things are true, but there's probably more to the story than, than what they're saying, right? And I'm, I'm guessing that that mean, horrible professor gave your grandson or granddaughter a, a syllabus at the beginning of the class that said, this is, this is what you need to do to, to pass this class, to do well in this class, and all of those, those things lie down. But it doesn't seem fair. Why? Because they don't like the result. You know? Well, they want grace. Right. They felt like they deserved grace. Right. And is there ever a more oxymoronic statement than, I deserve grace? <laughs> right? What's grace? Right. What you don't deserve. How can you deserve something that you don't deserve? <laughs> right? 
So again, these things of logic, as much as our society doesn't want to acknowledge how important logic is, logic is a very helpful tool that God has given us to work through and say, okay, if I believe this about God, then this other piece goes along with that. Right? That these are connected. There's, there are logical consequences of those truths about who God is and who he's made us to be. Right? So, it is not Westminster or the biblical position that, you know, God made some people to go to hell. Just get over it. Right? That's, that's not what the scripture tells us. We have a God who in the person of Jesus wept over Jerusalem. These things are being dealt with with grace and humility. That, that it's not simply, you know, well, I'm, I'm on the winning team, so sorry about you. No, but if these things of grace are things that we just never get over, that God would be so gracious as to save me. Right? That, that's going to lead us to, to, yes, grieve right? over the horrors of hell. Of the, the fact that any, even one, would go to hell is, is horrific. That these doctrines don't call us to be callous about hell. But at the same time, to be realistic and truthful about hell. That, that in fact, all of us deserve eternity in hell because of our rebellion against a holy and righteous God. And that God has predestined, these are going to heaven, these are going to hell. Not because he's unfair, but because he's gracious. Because none deserve anything but hell. The fact that he would save any is amazing. And the fact that he would predestine others to hell is not a matter of him being callous. He grieves over those. But that is what he has decreed. Again, for his own glory. That he would be shown to be just, holy, merciful, and gracious. Right? That all of his character will be revealed through these things. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Yeah, Mike. You know, saying that God grieves over his own decisions. Does God grieve over his own decisions? In other words, some are going to hell, some aren't. And he said that he grieves over those who are going to hell. Yeah. He made a decision who would go there and who wouldn't. Right. So is he grieving over his own decisions? Yeah. Yeah, the scripture says yes. That is how he can learn that. Yeah, right. And... Again, we can, we can approach that in, in a couple of different ways, right? One, relationally, I'm, I'm sure for any parents in the room, there have been things that you know are what your child needs, right? And yet they grieve you greatly, right? It's, as a kid, I never understood when my dad would say, this hurts me more than it hurts you, right? Say, so, yeah, right. I don't believe that a bit, right? Now as a dad, I, I totally get it. I totally understand. <laughs> yeah. And if we're all sinners, then how does God out who gets punished and who doesn't? Other than Jesus. Right. Absolutely it's Jesus, right? So so when God says, okay, here's the whole human race, every, every one of them sinful, every one of them guilty of rebellion against me. Every one of them who has sinned, and, and I as God have said, sin deserves death. Right? I, I was up front with humanity from the beginning, saying, you know, if you eat, you will surely die. Right? They believe the lie. No, you're not going to surely die. And ate anyway. And that every human being, save Christ, has, has entered into that same sin, that same rebellion, and is guilty of, of, of treason against God that deserves death and everlasting punishment. Okay? That's, that's the whole human race, with the only exception being Christ. 
So how does God determine who gets punished? He says, I will punish every human being that's, that's ever done evil, that's ever rebelled against me, without exception. Okay? And so as he goes to mete out that discipline, right? He comes to those who are in Christ, and he says, you've sinned against me. You've rebelled. You deserve death and eternal punishment in hell. Right? And he goes to, to put that on us, and Jesus says, wait, Dad! Put that on me. And, and so God visits the entire wrath of what we deserve on Jesus. Right? So as you go individually, every human being that's ever existed, or whoever will exist, it is not as if God punishes some and not others. He punishes every, every human being. Right? It's just that those who by his grace are in Christ, we are sheltered from that punishment and all of the punishment lands on Jesus. Right? So he is fair in punishing everyone who deserves punishment. But that's, that's the wonder of the gospel that Jesus takes that punishment on himself for us. God that. What? That God ordained that. Yes. So this is saying that, that that is exactly what God ordained. From before the foundation of time, he ordained everything that will ever come to pass, including not only his making us, but also his redeeming us. And that he decreed, I'm going to cover these with Jesus and not cover these with Jesus. Right? Knowing that without that covering, all those apart from Christ would perish and go to hell. And that he decreed that. Okay. And, and again, what we tend to, you know, have well up within us is, but, 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 but right? Instead of God, down on my face, you are totally sovereign over all things. Who am I to ever question anything that you do? Yeah, Mike. Uh, Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord hath made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. Hmm. And, and there's so much reference to his purpose, his glory in the Bible. Right. And as a new Christian, you see it, you kind of gloss over it, but eventually you get to the place you go, That's exactly right, Michael. That was Proverbs what? Proverbs 16.4. 16, 4. Excellent. Um, and, and that piece of making decrees about what will happen to people for eternity is in the God realm, right? The, it, it's God who, who determines what's going to happen to anybody for all eternity. That's not a human characteristic, right? And, and so... Again and again through scripture, we find these things of him saying, don't take vengeance, vengeance is mine, right? Why? Because that's too big for you. you. You don't have the perspective, you don't have the wisdom, you don't have what it takes to decree what, what somebody has or doesn't have as a result of those things. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if this is a question to, with this topic, but when Jesus walked the earth, he would say things like the Pharisees. That's because you are of your father, the devil. Yeah. Now, just ordinary sinners, the prostitutes, the thieves, the people who saw it from Jesus and Jesus gave birth, he never said anything that harsh. Mm -hmm. Right. So why? Why was, he, why was Jesus more harsh with some sinners than other sinners? Is that a fair yeah. thing of a question? Or, yeah, why would they label as having their father, I mean, father, think about the term father. Right. You are of your father, the devil. 
Right. So yeah. there are some people who are so unregenerate, their father's the devil? I mean, did he mean that literally, or did he mean that figuratively? Sure. So, so in Jesus dealing with the Pharisees and those who were the leaders of God's people, right, who were supposed to be teaching God's people his word <laughs> and, and these truths, Right? So that their response would be, oh my God, you are, you are so majestic. You are so, you know, that, that that's what God had called them to do. That's what their office was to do. And instead, they were teaching people to say, aren't I good? Right? I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty special. Right? And leading them astray, leading them away from God rather than leading them, come, you've got to see this God. You've got, he's, he's unbelievably great. You've got to see this, right? And so Jesus was particularly harsh with them, not just because they were worse sinners, but because they were leading people astray. Jesus said the same thing, woe unto you who lead even one of these little ones astray. Right? So it's not just the, the religious leaders, it's, it's parents, it's neighbors, right? That, that those who are given the task of leading people to Christ in worship, but instead lead people astray into idolatry, right? His, he, he has the harshest words. Now that's not to say that only those <coughs> unregenerate had Satan as their, their father. That was specifically because what they were claiming was, hey, you can't criticize us because Abraham is our father. Right? And so he flips their best commendation, right? Their biggest uh, credential on its head and says, no, Abraham's not your father. <clears throat> Satan's your father because he's the father of lies and what you're doing is lying. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So, but what this is saying is, is that all those who are outside of Christ, all unregenerate, right, are deserving of what they get. As are all those who are in Christ, deserving of that same thing, and yet Christ has taken that for us, right? But that God's decreed both of those things. Yeah, Jeffrey. Um, so I have a question on how much, uh, how much guilt, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and how much of it is trans transposed from Adam and how much is earned. And I say that in view of the, the, the light of uh, the, uh, when the child born to Bathsheba from David died, he said to him, I will see this child again. Mm -hmm. So there seems to me there's also an age of, reckons, uh, age of um, knowledge brought into this as well. You know, that somebody who's 25 was trespassing, knowingly against God, right. holds a different measure of wrath than a child who dies in two from leukemia, who has no ability to discern right from wrong in the right. sense of holiness at that point. Yep. Well, I mean, I guess it can be argued, you know, because when you're raising a kid up, you're raising them the way you should go. Right. So, um, as far as the idea of eternal punishment and um, God being justified in that wrath, where does the age of accountability come into that? Okay, yeah, great question, right? So how, if, if all humans deserve wrath, at, at what point do they become human to, to deserve that wrath? Yeah, I'm not talking about in the world versus outside the world, but I'm saying that we're given a glimpse in that the, the child right. of Bathsheba, David said, I'll see that child again. He takes right. off the sackcloth and he yeah. eats. Him. Right, so what is it that gives David that confidence? <laughs> Where would that confidence be presumption? And, and that's several chapters later to come. So we're going to come back to that. Okay. But it's way beyond the scope of what we can do today, right? Okay. So the, the thing for us to, to push, and, and all of us will have some resistance to this, right? And, and it may be at different places, okay? Well, what about the Mother Teresa's? Or what about the unborn child? Or what about the... The infant who's only, you know, three, you know, all of those things. So, and, and I'll, I'll just say, as a, as a precursor, there's, there's no age of accountability in the scripture, okay? That's a bogus, false teaching, okay? But m many of us just accept that because we've been taught that, that that's true of scripture. So we're going to see that, that that's not true. But didn't the Jews believe in the age of accountability? I mean, they have the, at 13, they have the 
like the ritual to accept the yeah. ritual into the covenant. Right. So what we're going to see is how that ties in with the covenant, and that ties into not when they are culpable, but when they are identified as a participating member in the fullness of the covenant community. That has to do not with their guilt and culpability. It has to do with their full participation in all of what the community of God's people include. And that that's, that has been horrifically misunderstood and then misapplied in terms of this age of accountability. But again, that's way beyond our scope today. Today, the thing that I want us to see is, is that every human being that ever existed, besides Christ, deserves eternal punishment. And that that's, that is a horrifically sobering reality. But it is what the scripture teaches. Yes? I, I think, you know, going back to your example of the student in class, is for me, I feel like maybe the person also missed the test. Yeah. And I have an A. And I'm yeah. like in the corner, like, I'm not really sure what this person did. Right. Like. And you don't really want to talk about it because right. you don't understand why they got a D and you got an A because it feels the same. Right. And it all is like, so you just sort of don't say anything, but make a big deal. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Or the teacher realizes, oh, I shouldn't have given you an A. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a little bit of guilt. Right? Yeah. And and in fact, for a lot of us, that's a lot of our Christian experience, right? Is that we live, instead of in freedom of being brought into the family of God, we live in fear, like, if I stay low enough, nobody will find out that I got in. I'm sure this is an incredible cosmic mistake, right? That that if God actually realized what he's done by letting me in, he's gonna he's gonna take that back. And as funny as we talk about that and see kind of the, you know, the, the sad part is is that for a lot of us that that is the cave that we're living in in fear and shame. And you know what the evil one loves? He loves to keep us in that cave. You mean fear and shame that we're not good enough to be included mm-hmm. and that we're going to be found out? To be right. Involved. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and because what the scripture says is that you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. And that we didn't get here because God kind of somehow missed it. <laughs> right? We got <clears> here <throat> because Jesus said, yes, Father, they do deserve that. And I'll take it all. <clears throat> all. There's none left. So you don't have to stay in that hole of shame. In fact, Jesus is throughout the scripture saying, come out into the light. Right? Come out into the light where you can see and you can testify. That's part of this whole thing of it being about God's glory. Right? Is is that in in the fullness of time when Jesus has come back and gathered all of us to himself, there's this incredible thing that's several different places in scripture. Of, of God calling all the demons and Satan and all the principalities, everything, everyone who has ever stood against him, right? And that, that he will gather his bride to himself and say, look, look, these are my people. And, and that the, the unanimous cry of those who are opposed to God will be, What? Do you know what they've done? Do you? <laughs> this is your bride? And he'll say, absolutely. I, Jesus will stand up and say, I have died for everything they've ever done. They are righteous in me. That's the God of the gospel. Right? So that we, to our neighbors, yes, I understand, you know, try and, you know, but, but it allows us to, by grace and humility, to say, hey, I, get it. I don't deserve this either. Come, let, let, me, let me take you with me to this God who's forgiven everything I've ever done. Yeah, Joe. Um, just thinking, and I'm wondering out loud, uh, before God created man, okay, does, do theologians and the Bible give us more insight as to what was happening in, in heaven 
between God and Satan, he also created Satan and angels. Right. So I have a feeling, and I don't know if I'm right about this, but right. because of that, that has impacted yes. everything that has happened after he created man. Right. And right. So, is, and we're going to. Like Right, so yes, we are going to see that in later chapters where we'll get to Satan and demons and, and all, all of those things. Again, God is never reacting, right? And, and that he's made these eternal decrees, including Satan's fall and everything that he's done, right? That, that God has done those, has decreed those, those things before any of it happened. Not only before he created us, but before he created angels, before he created anything, Okay. Part of our, our struggle is, is that so much more of our Satanology and, and demonology comes from Dante's Inferno than it does actually from the scripture, right? That's just part of our cultural baggage and inheritance, right? And so there's, there's a lot of those things that, that we, you know, know from the, from the TV, you know, in the various different shows on angels and, and God and that kind of stuff that's not true, right? So there are pieces about... Satan in Scripture, they're they're just annoyingly few, and, and and so we'll we'll look at those. But but the the bottom line is that God has decreed everything that comes to pass here and then over here. Okay, predestined or ordained relates to time, and mm -hmm. and uh, the way I understand it, God's created time that stands outside it, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering how much of foreordained and predestined is misinterpreted as a God wound up the clock right. knowing where that clock would go versus God stands outside when he when he foreordains and predestines something. Right. It's a, it almost like in my mind it's like it actually happened then, you know, because he stands outside in time. Right. Is that yep. just, yeah, and there are pieces of then of that again, it's mystery. How do we understand God's relationship with time? Yeah. For him a, a thousand years is like a day. I, Okay, how does that work? I, I have no idea, right? So, so some of this, you know, again, we, we tend to want to boil all this down to a formula, to an equation, to, you know, how much, how much of it was Adam versus how much of it was us? Well, 23%. What is, okay, if you knew that, what does that do to help you? I, I don't know, but we're, we're, we're completely culpable for our sin as well as the sin that we inherited. Yeah, about going to predestination before now. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the pre part of predestined, the four part of foreordained are all chronological. You're right. They're before these things, right? right? And so how does that, that work? There are ways in which I don't, I don't know, and nobody, none of us know, right? But what we do know is, is that God is the one who has done it, and he's done that in ways that are not reactionary, that are not, that are not him looking through or understanding something beyond time and making any of those decisions based on anything about us. Heidi? Um, for me, actually, I've discovered since really understanding about predestination that having that in mind actually helps with witnessing. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of people who just don't quite understand and they're like, well, you're a religious person, which is the worst thing. I hate when people say you're religious. Right. And then it's like, well, no, I'm not. I said, if you know my life, I said, I was running as fast as I could the other way when right. Jesus was chasing me. All yes. I know is Jesus was chasing me since I was a little girl. Yeah. He tried to corner me at 16. I said, no, thank you. I got things to do. 21, yeah. same thing, no thanks. I got some more fun to be had. Yeah. And finally, just grabbed me by the scrub. I said, I just got recruited in this thing when I learned about Jesus. It just <coughs> exploded in me. I knew it was true. Right. So, you know, in, in giving that to people, it kind of really disarms them. Because yeah. they want to come at you with this sort of, well, moralism. Well, you don't live up to, you know, moralism, you know, this yeah. moralistic standard. It's like, hey, man, look. Jesus, I just, he just came after me, and when I heard about him, I knew it was true. And I, I can't say that that was something I was seeking. Yeah. I didn't choose to become a Christian. Right. And that really gets people's right. minds just spinning. And, yeah. and, and it's as much you just have to leave it there. Yeah. And if they want more, they'll put, you know, the Holy Spirit's working on them. They're going to come back and <laughs> explain more about them. Yeah. There's a classic <coughs> book, Your God is Too Small, that gets at some of these kinds of things. Is that, again, we keep trying to take 
the infinite God and, and condense him into what we can understand, right? And so, again, if there's no mystery to your God, he's not the God of the Bible, right? He, he, the only things that we know about him are the things that he's revealed to us in his word. And so we're trying to make sense out of all of that. But, but we're going to keep coming to the edge of that cliff that we can't get past. And, and I, know, I know only what I know by God's grace is of what he's revealed to us. And that's why it's so helpful to have those who've gone before us, who've, who've condensed and brought all these things, and this is what the scripture teaches. All right. So, um, number four, his decrees are final. Again, he's not reacting to anything. He's, he's decreed everything that will come to pass. And, and at the end of the day, it's not going to be like the professor. Yeah, but if you only understood my circumstance. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't understand. I didn't realize that. Uh, you get a pass. Right? His, his decrees are final. Right? So even when he is incredibly gracious and patient, right? I think of Job, right? Keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And, and after all the stuff that Job's gone through, understand, you know, he, he comes, you know, finally at the end, he's coming to God and going, I don't, I don't get this, I don't understand this, I don't, you know, uh, you know. And God doesn't just make him a grease spot on the, on the road, you know. It, it's absolutely astounding. But as patient as he is with Job and all of those things, he finally gets to the point and he goes, okay, um, so where were you when I made everything that there is? Did I have to come and consult with you? Was I trying to figure out how black holes and antimatter were going to work and then think, I know, I'll ask Joe. <laughs> right? No. He is God and we're not. Okay? The primary thing for me that this chapter is addressing again and again in all of these different ways comes down to that. He's God and I'm not and you're not and we're not. He's the only one worthy of all praise. He's the only one who we would want to determine all things. And he has determined all things and that's fine. Job's um, friends and their constant onslaught of comments <coughs> Job about his condition. Um, I see quoted on the internet all the time. Mm. As if it, it's godly. Mm -hmm. And people like, amen, amen, like, 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 no. Right. No, no <laughs> my friends, go further, read a little more. Yes. Yeah. Where God says, pray for them, Job. Right. And I'll forgive them. Mm. And, anyways, it's, it reminds me of what Heidi said about the Pharisee and mm. Job's friends were them too. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So, number five, the elect in Christ are chosen completely by grace. We've already been hammering on that, right? It's not anything in us, right? And we, we go, yes, and, and then in life, right, it's like, yeah, but, no, it's by grace. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve it. That doesn't drive us to the hole or the cave. That drives us into the light to say, you're right, I don't deserve this. I'm, I'm, I'm only here as a trophy of God's grace. You gotta come check out this God. He's unbelievably gracious. Right? And all these elect and no others are redeemed. Again, this, this, this is already contained in what we've said, but again, these are things that we tend to, to struggle with, so it says it again, and reemphasizes that. Right? <clears throat> Who, who's gonna be in heaven? <coughs> those who are in Christ, and only those who are in Christ. There's not some other way. Jesus was not stuttering when he said, there's no way to the Father but by me. Right? So you can argue with that, you can scream against that, have tantrums against that, it doesn't change it. His decrees are final, and the elect in Christ are, are chosen completely by grace, and they're the only ones who will be redeemed. Now, the great news is that we don't know who the redeemed are. Right? So you go, well, I don't know if I should share with my neighbor because I don't know if they're elect or not. Right? Leave that to God. He knows who the elect are. You just share with your neighbor. Right? 
So that's sometimes the, the argument against these doctrines, right? People will say, well, if you believe these things, you'll never share your faith, right? But John Calvin and those who were very helpful in terms of hammering these things out and showing us this is what the scripture teaches, do you know that they had more missionaries going out of Geneva than, than almost any other church in, in history? I mean, they were sending people to all over the globe. Why? Because God can forgive even someone like me? Well, then, he can forgive my, you know, crabby Vermont neighbor, right? And who knows who he'll save? So our job is simply to declare the wonder of, of who this God is. And then, uh, seven, he's chosen to pass over all others in absolute justice. Again, that, so we're going back to, you know, God's predestined those to eternal life and to everlasting death. He's the one who's decreed that. And, and he has, in fact, passed over those who will not believe in Christ. And they are getting exactly what they and we deserve. Yeah. I really like that the um, confession uses the words passed over because um, of the, um, the Exodus and that whole picture in mm -hmm. the Exodus. Yeah. People were responsible to do what they knew to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like those words passed over and yeah. they have ministered to me many times. Right. Yep. And and it's hard, right? It, it, these things are not the easy part of Christian theology, right? These things are really, really hard. And and the reality that, um, again, we tend to think of it in our in our human terms because that's all we know, right? And so we tend to think of this as I've, I've mentioned to you before about my mom going to the SBCA or the the you know. Um, Pet uh, shelter. Shelter. Thank you. The, the animal shelter. Uh, you know, to get a cat that dad didn't want, so that we could have a cat. You know, that was always the the thing growing up. And, and but I remember very much that that was always something that was hard for mom, right? To get to to get one kitten out of out of the animal shelter, knowing that the rest of them are left. Right. And so we tend to think of that in our terms because we're limited, right? We could only take so many kittens home, right? Even if we took every cat there at the animal shelter that day, right, and, and became crazy cat people who had way more cats than we could ever take care of, right, we still couldn't go to every uh, animal shelter every day and take all, you know, we're, we're limited, right? So one of the really, really hard things about this is that God could Take everybody home. Right? He could, like what our Unitarian neighbors believe, and Universalists, he could say, you know what? I'm, I'm giving everyone grace. I'm going to save everyone. He could have done that. And he did not. Right? And that's not John Calvin saying that. But Jesus is saying, you're of your fa father, Satan, right? You will experience wrath. You will experience everlasting death. These are what Jesus said, right? He was very clear that there were two different groups. Those who would believe in him and have life, and those who would not and have death. And that, that's really hard. And, and forces us to the mystery of God as he truly is rather than God as we might like him to be. And I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've sat down and talked with folks who say, but I, I just can't believe in that kind of God. I just, my God wouldn't do things like that. Well, he's not just your little God. He alone is the God of all things. Yeah. Um, I think it's very revealing that when this man Moses walked up into that thick black cloud on Sinai, and the earth was quaking and 
thunder was uh, rumbling and the lightning was flashing. The Lord hands him those tablets of stone written in God's own finger. Mm -hmm. God's own finger. And we know those Ten Commandments. Right. They're very revealing about the human heart. Mm -hmm. The Lord God knows how he made each one of us. Mm -hmm. We're born human. Yeah. We have these tendencies. Right. And uh, when um, Moses came down that mountain, he, he threw those tablets down because he was very upset at the people of Israel. And when the Lord God replaced those Ten Commandments, they were exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah. He didn't change his mind. Right. He tells us very much about the human heart. And I think about that second commandment. Mm -hmm. The second commandment, you shall not have any, you shall not have any graven image. So right. I think it's, it's our human nature. It's our human nature to create God in, in something that's comfortable for each right. one of us. The way that, that we want our nature. Yeah. We want to make him something that, oh, he's very acceptable to me. Mm -hmm. And I know about all of you, but I'm on my way to heaven. Right. And, and we look at all the denominational churches and we see that being played out. Mm -hmm. But the finger of God. Mm -hmm. But the finger of God is also something very revealing about the human heart. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're out of time. Let me just direct you on the back. You'll find um, about halfway down the longer paragraph there, these two quotes uh, from Scripture. Uh, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, that Jesus, This is, again, what the Scripture teaches. Jesus himself said, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. And the, the passages are down there in the footnotes, 1 John 4.10 and then uh, the Gospel of John 6.65 6, and 66. Um, let me just encourage you to, through the week, read through those, meditate on them, think about them. Uh, and he, here's the thing, is, is that these truths about Scripture, right, can, can bring us to a point where we just, we just go running into the night, right? This, this God is too, I, I, I don't even know what to do with this God, right? To, to resist that urge and rather to say, okay, Lord, show me more. Show me more of who you are. I, I want to understand you and know you and worship you as you truly are rather than I, as I'd like you to be. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace to us. We praise you uh, that you are not a God of our creation, um, that you're so much better. Uh, and we pray that you would help us to understand these things and to worship you in spirit and truth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.